Welcome back to Sabbath School, guys. This week, we're going to be going over Lesson 10 for June 6, Recipe for Revival. You can find this lesson at the link below or in the description. The format of this lesson is a little bit different. You're used to seeing Mr. Gruffs talking away at these lessons. <laughs> but this week, I'm going to be your host, and we are going to go on an adventure. You're going to see clips from some time that our family spent out in the woods. You're going to hear a Bible story. You're going to see some nature nuggets and some clips. And I'm going to be here to walk you through it. The first thing you're going to see is Mr. Groff sitting by a fire, and he's going to be talking about a spark. And as you're watching this and listening, I want you to be thinking of this question. The question is, how does a revival start? So strap up your boots, grab your water bottle, and get ready to go on an adventure. Come on, let's go. Have you ever walked in a forest and looked at the strong, tall trees? The ones have been there for years and years and years. Have you ever looked at the forest floor in those forests? Covered with dead trees and trees that once were, that are just laying there on the ground. Some of them rotting, some of them newly fallen. There's this word in science that they use to describe energy. They, they call it potential energy. Now this word is used to describe water that's behind a dam that's just waiting there stored energy waiting to be unleashed same kind of idea as when somebody holds a ball in the air and there's a lot of energy in that ball but it's stored because it's not moving yet well that same word can be used to describe those dead trees laying on the forest floor they call that stored chemical energy. And what does it take to make that energy active? All it takes is a spark. A single spark can set a whole forest on fire. In our Sabbath school lesson this week, we're going to study about a spark. You see, long ago in the land of Judah, there was a king who came along who reinstated true worship to God. And that's gonna be what our lesson's about. It's about this king who was brave and courageous and became the spark that his people needed to turn back to God, the one and only true God who loved them. Did you catch what starts a revival? It only takes a spark to get a group of people moving to, to have a revival, just one little spark. Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 29, and we're going to take a look at Hezekiah's reign. 2 Chronicles 29 Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east, and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves, and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful, and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be negligent, 
For the Lord has chosen you to stand in His presence, to minister to Him, and to be His ministers, and make offerings to Him. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had prepared for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. So at the beginning of Hezekiah's reign, there are four things that he does. First, he confronts unfaithfulness. Second, he demonstrates the consequences. Slavery. Third, he makes a personal commitment. He says, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord. And then lastly, he invites the Levites to stand in God's presence. Stand in his presence because God has chosen them. Now let's take a little side trail over to the Overlook and discover the secret of unlocking potential. We're going to see how a pine cone is related to one person's influence. What you got there, Gunnison? Got a pine cone. Gunnison, do you know that they classify pine cones into a bunch of different classes? You've, have you ever looked at a pine cone, our viewers today? There's all different sizes and shapes, ones that come off of junipers and off of pine trees. Well. I want to tell you about a special cone today. It's called a serotonous pine cone. Now, serotonous pine cones grow on a tree called a, a lodgepole pine, and they can be found out west. Well, there's something special about the lodgepole pine. Yeah, did you know that? What's something that? very special. Their seeds, as you see in this one, you see every place that there's an opening, there are seeds that have fallen out every time you see an opening on a pine cone. Well, on a serotonous pine cone, each one of these little areas is held tightly together by a thing called resin. It's like a really hard sap. It's stronger than really, really hard glue. Well, that resin holds that pine cone together and prevents that, little, that seed from coming out. And the only thing that opens that pine cone so that the seed can come out is, is fire. So for the longest time, there were areas in our United States that didn't have new growth from uh, lodgepole pine until they discovered it was because they were preventing forest fires from coming through the area. And when forest fires, in a more controlled way, were able to burn some of the area, serotonous cones released their seeds and more trees were able to grow. Well, this week we've been talking about revival and what revival looked like for in Hezekiah's time that people came back to life in their spiritual lives. They came back to loving God again and they came back to serving Him and especially as we were talking about with the Passover being kept again. Well, this illustration of the serotonous pine cone serves pretty well for us to understand what revival looks like. Revival looks like those serotonous cones opening up after being closed, they say for years and years and years those little seeds can survive within the cone. But, like we said, when somebody serves as a spark, when somebody sets a group of people on fire for God, they can open up those cones. Just like you and me, we can be that spark. What a view. Let's continue the story now in 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles 30. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. So they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, that the people should come and keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. And many people came together in Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great assembly. They set to work and removed the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for burning incense they took away and threw into the Kidron Valley. And they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the fourteenth day of the second month, for Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone 
who sets his heart to seek God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even though not according to the sanctuary's rules of cleanness. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. So we learn in our story this week that Hezekiah, he reinstates the Passover. And what would that mean for the children of Israel? Right, the children of Israel for years had been living a life of sacrificing to Baal and to all these other gods of the Canaanites. And Hezekiah was calling them out of that idol worship. And he was calling them back to God. And in the process of this, he reinstates this festival. Sometimes it's called the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And in this case, it's in the Bible here, it's called the Passover. And what was the Passover? If we remember, the Passover was the celebration at the end of the last plague in Egypt. You see, the children of Israel are calling back in their memory, back to the beginning of their time as God's people. And this was when the Egyptians had experienced 10 plagues, just tearing their economy, their society, their agricultural system, everything just gets torn apart. Sin and rebellion against God just gets torn to the ground. And in this judgment of sorts that happens to Egypt, God's people are shown to be his people. They're completely spared from judgment. And the last crowning act to show that God's people are God's people is this thing called the Passover. You see, the firstborn was gonna be killed in Egypt. And God said, if you participate with my plan on this, if you sacrifice the lamb, if you remove all the leaven from your house, the leaven is like uh, the yeast in their bread, so they made crackers, right? If you eat this meal in the way and you put the blood on the doorposts, then when the judgment angel comes, it will pass over. Now, what would that mean to the children of Israel if the angel passed over them? You know, up until this point, they had been living as slaves, right? They had been building somebody else's kingdom. Every day they had gone out, they had worked in these places where they made bricks and people said they may have been, they may have helped to build some of the pyramids that still stand today. Their work wasn't work they chose. It wasn't work that was enjoyable to them. And they were building another man's kingdom. And this angel passes over them. They're under the blood post that has the blood and they're declared innocent before God. They have peace with God. And for us, you know, that's a great reminder. And for the for people in Hezekiah's time as well, it's a great reminder that God is seeking to have peace with you. You know, in this world where there's turmoil and upheaval and riots, there's few places where we can find peace. But we realize our identity when God declares his peace over us. We get this revival of sorts, this coming back to life when we know that we're at peace with God. So if you guys remember that Jesus celebrates this festival too, he celebrates the Passover. During the Last Supper, that's what they're celebrating. And for the children of Israel, they realize that this lamb and the blood of this lamb is what declared them as innocent before God. And it allowed that angel to pass over them. It was the sign. But if you remember when Jesus celebrates the Last Supper, there's bread present, there's grape juice or wine present, but there's no lamb on the table. The lamb had been sacrificed for the, for the disciples. The, the lamb was present with them. Jesus was this great Passover lamb. He is this great pastoral over lamb. He's the one whose blood declares you and me innocent before God. He's, it's his character, it's his life, it's his testimony that allows us to stand before God as innocent. Then the whole assembly agreed together to keep the feast for another seven days. So they kept it for another seven days with gladness. So there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem.
Then the priests and the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came to his holy habitation in heaven. Wow, that was a lot of information. Hezekiah celebrates and then extends the celebration of Passover for one more week by popular demand. Have you ever wanted to extend a week of camp, or maybe a week of prayer, or camp meeting, or maybe even extend events like Acrofest or Music Fest? Well, let's meet Mr. Croft by the Creek to talk about that very feeling. Have you ever noticed that hiking and trail maps always lead to water features? We love them, especially in Tennessee. We have these deep valleys and these high peaks. We call them mountains, but they're really just big hills. But they make up this great matrix of beautiful little creeks that drop down elevation. And we love to take our hiking trails right next to them. They just remind us of this power, this amazing thing that we get to live around called water. And you know, I don't know about you, but I know quite a few songs about water. There's a, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, or I've got peace like a river, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got love like an ocean in my heart. And I was wondering, why do we use water to illustrate these wonderful char characteristics that God puts in our heart? Love, peace, joy, and faith. I and mean, why do we use water? We, and I would suppose that we use the idea of water because in the whole time that you've been, well, I've been recording this and you've been seeing this little water behind me, it hasn't stopped flowing. And it still hasn't stopped flowing. We think about things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, these beautiful fruit of the spirit that Jesus has put in our hearts. And we think about water because these beautiful waterfalls that are there continually almost. And that's what Jesus, I think Jesus inspired people to look at water in that way because that's what they're like in our hearts. You know, these people who came to Hezekiah's Passover celebration, they urged him. They wanted to, to keep this thing going. They experienced peace with God. They experienced love, joy, peace. They experienced the patience of God and the mercy of God toward him. And they said, we got to keep this thing going. So he says, seven more days, seven more days. Let's do this, this feast, seven more days. And I think it's a good illustration for us. You know, I don't know about you, but I've gone to camp meetings or maybe a week of prayer and I just know that Jesus is knocking on my heart and I see him developing me these wonderful things like peace, patience, love, kindness and these wonderful fruit of the spirit and then I get tricked into believing that only seven more days of this because I believe the lie that God's wonderful characteristics are limited to a location and they're not you know for Hezekiah and his people it was they were limited to the location because the tabernacle is where God's presence was that's where his sanctuary was but the Bible tells us in the New Testament that you and I are the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit that he, he lives in us Jesus came he died on the cross so that he could purchase the right to put himself in you and me that's what the lady at the well that Jesus talked to experienced. He came up to her and said, you like water? And he says the same to us, you like fountains? Do you like these amazing waterfalls like the one that my wife and I went to this week called Ozone Falls? Do you like this? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't this water amazing? Well, guess what? I wanna put in your heart a spring of water welling up into everlasting life. Jesus' revivals for the Christian aren't constrained to location, to a time, to a place. They happen in our heart. They can happen every morning. They can happen every day. Jesus wants to live in our life, guys. He wants to be like that fountain of water behind me, continually flowing. Not like a stagnant pond either. He wants to flow out of you. He wants you to be his waterfall. He wants you to be the waves of the ocean. He wants you to be this babbling brook behind me. 
So next time you pull up a trail map, or next time you're out hiking, and you see water, water that continues to flow, remember that the love from your Heavenly Father continues to flow always towards you. Wow, what an adventure we have had. Let's recap our journey. First, we stopped at the campfire where we talked about potential energy and how it only takes one little spark to start a fire. Next, we took in a view of the Overlook where we talked about unlocking potential. We learned about the pine cone and how it has to go through a forest fire in order for the seeds to be released and then the tree can grow, a beautiful tree. It reminds us that death has to happen for life to take root and grow. Then, we had a reminder of the Passover. God passes over us. He absorbs our sin and he makes peace with us. Lastly, we discussed revival. Revival isn't limited to a location. It's happening all the time. We are experiencing it right this very moment. On this Sabbath day, I'd like to invite you to go out in nature. Allow God to teach you lessons from the creation that He has made. All our lessons today were discovered in nature. God spoke to us, He showed us, and we told you. So whatever lessons you learn, don't hold them to yourself. I invite you to go tell someone. Go tell your mom, your dad, your brother, sister. Text a friend. Tell somebody. If you want to, you can leave a comment below and tell us here. I encourage you to get in touch with God. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, to teach you, and to live in you. Now, may you go spark a revival in someone else today. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the life that you've given us. We thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, for sparking a revival in us. And I pray that everyone watching here today will be blessed by your love. May we learn many things about you through your nature, which you've created. And also may we remind ourselves that you've created us. We are your workmanship. Lord, speak through us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You stuck around this long. It's time for a bonus feature. Enjoy some little clips from our camping trip this past week. There you go. Oh, my. 